okay, just slipped yeah. around a rock. There he is. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Nice crank, 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 crank. He's coming back, yeah? Uh -huh. We gotta get him over that ledge. Lean back, There's yeah. some muscle on the other end of that line. Yep. Crank on the way down. Yep, crank, 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 Something on. It was easy, everybody would do it, huh? Oh, I don't want to show Steven up, so I'm going to let him do this one. <laughs> Thanks, man. This is a story about obsession, a fishing obsession. Rods, reels, sinkers and swivels, leaders and lines, bells and whistles. Uh, yeah, okay, no whistles, but all the rest of it. I was introduced to Stephen and Jordan Kilkenny while on a spear fishing trip in Hawaii. These two brothers share a passion for shore fishing, specifically for giant trevally or alua, and bluefin trevally, omilu. We made 12 foot, 12, 6, and 13, but me and Jordan kind of figured out we like the 12s the best. The whole setup is designed because like Alua's like the big bait, and if you can't physically cast some of the baits we're sliding, I mean three to five pound bait sometimes, so you can't just cast that out. So it's designed so that you get your, your lead anchored, and then you have a piece, uh, a setup where you can twist it on your line and slide it down. That's okay. why it's called slide baiting. This is a very, very different type of fishing, and these guys are fiercely dedicated. See that over to the left? They're sliding a baited circle hook down what is effectively a fixed fishing line. We'll get into this more later, but for now, that's the basis for all of it. So you're gonna put this on there, obviously you're gonna put this on there. Twist it on there, and then- Up rod, here at the yeah, rod. Up at the rod. So it's you've already be, cast this It's gonna this be thing way out. in the water, right? So you're gonna take that, and all you gotta do is you just let it go. And that slides down, and now you're, it gets stuck on the notch, which is kinda good, because it keeps your bait kinda like mid-water, which uh -huh. is good. And then when the fish bites, grabs the hook, runs down, slides past the knots, all the way past the knots, and then boom, you're locked in. And that's when the hook And that's sets. when it's hooked. And that's hooked, right there. And then you're fighting the fish, and that's what it is. And it breaks off, so you have a little lead line here, that breaks away, and then you're just straight to the fish. And you got the barb crimp down yeah. on that. We normally always crimp our barbs. But why Why is that? Uh, I find it's actually better for hooky up ratio. Really? Yeah, it just slides in easier. And if you hook like bycatch, like a turtle or monk seal or whatever, it, it'll come out easier yeah. than having a barb hooked on there. And this is a smaller hook, Ozzy. Yeah. Like and with this amount of gear, this isn't just like a head out for one night mm. type of deal. You guys are typically nah, you know, make a weekend out of it. Yeah, usually there's so much gear prep involved for a lure fishing that if you're gonna go fishing, you wanna make sure you have at least two, three nights, or else you're just putting in a lot of effort for just a short little window. You can get yeah. lucky though. Yeah. Right, oh, for sure. Able to swim at speeds up to 31 miles per hour and noted for their ability to launch out of the water, it's no real surprise that GTs are a popular game fish, but most of the time, they're pursued by boat and whatever your perception of shore fishing is, up the intensity by a couple of notches. It kind of looked fun from, from the uh, beach over there, but now it's like looking more serious out here. <laughs> yeah. And do you have an idea, like are Alua targeting a specific fish, um, crustacean? There, there's whatever. like certain baits that are better than others for some reason. Maybe, I don't know if it tastes better to them or presents better out there, but there's certain ones that are better than others, but they're scavengers. Um, I need to grab a lid real quick. For the hang bait setup, we go a little bit lighter mono for the breakaway lead line, 30 pound test. 
Sorry, because if action happens or you just get like hung up in a bad spot, you want to just be able to just pop it free real quick. Right, you're giving up your lead for today anyway. Yep. But you're getting the rest of your rig back. Yep. Bend little hooks on there. So it'll be like a grappling hook. Once you cast it out, any rock, it'll just grab right onto it. So you're not... Cause oh, because you times, want that tension on the line. Yeah, you want it to get stuck and you want it to get it stuck as far out as you can most of the time. So you have this little grappling hook and it's just dragging along the bottom and it hooks up and it'll just get stuck. Versus if you just cast it out, just the lead, it might be bouncing along the bottom. Right, it's tumbling. And coming and, in yeah. and you just want it to get stuck. And you're losing your tension on the line. Yep. And so and then, with it all night. And then sometimes you get lucky and the lead wires will bend out and you might get your lead back, but pretty rare. Okay. Usually, usually this is kind of designed to break away yep. once it once the fish hits. So this is all ready to cast. The next step, and probably one of the most important, is you wet the line, because that when you cast it, if you don't wet the line, it's gonna leave you a nice burn mark. Right oh here. yeah, no. So I'll do that real quick. Oh yeah. That's what we're gonna use right there. All right. There's a certain kind of fish that's super territorial, it's called a cala. And then we uh, we always bridle through the nose. And we, if we don't catch on them, we let them go. And since there's supposedly a steep learning curve to casting these rods, the brothers get a couple of them set up before I give it a try. Meanwhile, I get my fins and snorkel ready for a bait acquisition dive. It may have looked like we have plenty in that kiddie pool, but I'm told it can disappear just about as quick as a shark can swim through. If we slide bait like an hour before sun goes down, that's good. Okay. Yeah. With weights exceeding triple digits in larger specimens, GTs, or Alua, are a formidable adversary and they can cover lots of ground in a day, eating everything from cephalopods and fish to the occasional seabird. While we're skipping the seabirds, we do fill up our stockpiles with a diverse collection of local animalia. Yeah, so sweet little dive here and finding uh, taco, octopus, and uh, green eel, which will be used for bait. And uh, picked up a roy, invasive species. So uh, this guy will get used for chum and cut bait, but good to get off the reef. Tons of fun, the ocean provides. Steven and Jordan fish these level wind reels like they are an anatomical extension of themselves. Try it again. While I have a different experience. Well, better. So these reels, they don't have a winding mechanism. So you gotta run your finger back and forth to keep that spool level. If you don't, you're gonna get a ridge in there and that built up line is gonna rub against the bars of the reel and either cause a line failure or you're just not gonna be able to crank the reel. Thum, 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 thum. Super bird's nest again. Son of a 
dude. Their patience is admirable, but after a while, we just need to get the rods set up. So they take over while I work on bait acquisition with equipment that is a lot more comfortable to me. Money, just keep doing that. Honey, you guarantee. You actually caught one. Like with a lot of specialty things, right? It's like the work is in the prep. And the fishing part is uh, is kind of waiting. So I'm excited to see what's happening here, but at the same time, I don't want to be too excited. Like most of my favorite critters on land and in sea, the conservation story on these yeah. fish is a bit complicated. The presence of a potential neurotoxin in their system, called ciguatera, limits their commercial viability. But in many areas of the islands, alua remain a traditional food source. GTs, or alua in Hawaiian, are of great cultural importance here. Not only are they referenced in songs about the creation of the islands, but the fish are prized for their fighting abilities and at one time were likened to that of the greatest human warriors. They're commonly fished for at night and during dawn and dusk. One of the elements that makes Stephen and Jordan so successful is the sheer persistence. They spend line, more Danny. time doing this than just about anyone else. They don't drink, they don't party, they work and they fish. That's it. Yeah, Hasn't been dark that long, but uh, got an early strike and took so, drag on the reel. It was great. And then it was gone. Since trevally aren't the only fish that will eat these baits, they have to be checked and rebaited numerous times throughout the day and night. Crank, 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 crank. Good job, good job. Just don't put too much strain on the handle. Just crank down and pull up. I told you, right hand high, left hand low. Left hand low. Yeah, pull up, now pull back, yeah. now crank. Okay. Lean back. There's yeah. some muscle on the other end of that line. Yep. Good, pull back. One or two down. Good, up. Just keep doing that, little pumps, okay? What you see is a guy fighting a fish, but this is a team effort. On top of the coaching, the Kilkennys are moving the other 11 rods over, under, and around the fight with no tangles. These guys are pros. Okay, crank down, crank down, crank down. I know you're losing steam, but keep her coming, my friend. Oh, uh, I got gas in the tank, buddy. Yep. Yeah, keep going, keep like going. like to hear going. that. Yeah. Okay, keep yeah. cranking. Keep going, keep going. Crank down. You gotta get them over that ledge. Good job, you're doing great. Almost there. He's coming back, yeah? Yeah, okay, so come by. I got you back. Just go slow, go slow, go slow, go slow. Watch your rod tip, good eye. Go slow, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Crank, 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 crank. Okay, stop, 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 stop. Crank on the way down. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Pull back with two hands. There we go. Yeah, crank down. So, so, so. Uh, yeah, under. under. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, coming around you. Yeah, Mike. Okay, crank on the way down. Crank on the way down. Get, get that leader in Steven's hand. Okay. Steven, just gap the thing. That's like a 50. 
every day that you pull out a fish the size of your torso. Just holding it for a picture is a challenge after 20 minutes of playing this thing. The Lua fishermen don't normally keep their catch. However, since this is my first one, keeping and eating it is a rite of passage, one that I don't mind at all. We haul this over to a nearby tidal pool to bleed it, as you do with most saltwater fish you want to eat. Crazy. Stuff doesn't always go to plan and just happened to work out this time. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. It, it's uh, lots of technique, lots of earned knowledge over the years. Your pre work seems critical. Yeah. And then the endurance game is, it's like, they could really hit at any time. Yep. Watching Jordan and Steven patiently tend to their rods throughout the night, you probably wouldn't guess that GTs can be somewhat of a status symbol among globe-trotting saltwater fly fishermen. Whole economies have been built on this fish, for wealthy tourists in places like the Maldives and the Seychelles, which is partly what makes the brothers' approach here refreshingly humble and lacking in pretense. No $100,000 boats, no guides, no room service, just shore fishing. Omilu, the bluefin trevally, are smaller than GTs and potentially because of that less likely to carry large degrees of ciguatera. They are also renowned as sashimi quality sushi. While not formally tracked by the state of Hawaii, Stephen and Jordan tag this fish to keep track of migration patterns, numbers, and general species health amongst their fellow Alua anglers. That's good to go. Stick it back in the water. So as far as like the the GT fishing goes, like where's this day rate, I guess? Very good. Very good. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, getting a strike is a really good day. Landing a fish, but landing two fish, that's an epic day. It's sort of the biggest fish that we have that cruises along the reef. So it's like kind of cool to put yourself to the challenge of trying to catch something big from the rocks with all of like the obstacles working against you. It's like got the reef, the rocks, then you have the fish trying to get into the reef and the rocks, and it's just, yeah. Because all I could think about was the rocks. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, 
And while we were rigging all this stuff up, you guys were just so confident and didn't really mention it that much. So I was like, well, maybe it's not that big of a thing. And then the very first strike, right? Is yeah. like, oh, cut. rocks, yeah. cut, cut on the rocks, re retie. And then I was like, this is gonna happen every time. Yeah. Every no, time. Definitely has a challenge. Before we get back and cut up that alua, we get to retrieve our weights, something these guys as divers do regularly. Yes, this keeps the reef clean, but lead also costs money. And these guys do a lot of fishing. It's simple economics. This big fish eats small fish that eat algae that carry that neurotoxin. And uh, it's like a cumulative deal in here. So this guy was obviously eating reef fish. Oh, for sure. If he didn't have any appetite for reef fish, we wouldn't have caught him. Uh -huh. Yep. Um, so he's probably packing around some degree of Cicaterra. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. Possibly, maybe. Yeah. Ciguatera, a toxin that can build up in the fish's system, is a it's valid concern. And while most fishermen avoid it by releasing the larger, over 100 pound specimens, your likelihood of poisoning increases directly in proportion to the amount of fish that you eat. There is no way of cooking out the poison and little to no way of knowing which fish might have a high amount. So it's a little bit of a gamble, Feels firm. but one that, as I eat it rarely, I'm willing to take on this trip. Like anything wild, the risk is in your hands. Like the texture. Mm -hmm. Kind of similar to a marlin. You've ever had really? marlin yeah. poke. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Yeah, thanks a bunch. Locally, this fish goes into sausage or is smoked for friends and family. I found panko batter fried in beef tallow and finished with lemon to be amazing enough for a summer's worth of fish fries, sequaterra or not. Yes, I held the rod for what seemed like forever while landing this 50-something pound behemoth, but I think of myself more as a team member here, an onlooker participating in something spectacular. Because the amount of knowledge, gear, and expertise that goes into fishing for GTs from shore is something amazing. You might call it an obsession.